Hi, this is Brad Linder with Lilliputing, and this is the 1GX1, which is a little laptop with a 7-inch display, a QWERTY keyboard, and it's the latest machine from One Netbook, which is a company that's been making little laptops like this for the last couple of years. But this one's unusual for a couple of reasons, which I'll get to momentarily. First, I'll tell you that it's available for pre-order starting June 29th for $840 and up, and it should ship to customers in August. What I'm looking at here is a pre-production prototype that was sent to me for testing purposes. And so there are two things that make this unusual. The first is that it's the first device from the company that's really designed with gaming in mind. So uh, if you look at the design, it actually looks like it's inspired by Dell's Alienware M51. And we've even got this glow up back with the key combination there. So we've got two fans blowing air out through the back. Most of the ports are lined up around the back. And if you look underneath, you'll actually see these grooves here that you'll be able to clip uh, optional detachable game controllers to. So the idea is you'll be able to hold it in your hands like a Nintendo Switch. Now those game controllers aren't available yet, but uh, I'll post another video when I have a chance to test them out. So the idea is though, again, you'll be able to hold it, have the screen sort of be uh, between it and play without necessarily touching the screen or the keyboard. Uh, the controllers also support wireless, so you'll be able to take them off and use them like a uh, wireless controller. So uh, it's supposed to support gaming. It's got the light up back. And you can also see here that we've got an RGB backlit keyboard that supports a number of different sort of patterns and colors. And you can even uh, adjust the color just on specific regions of the keyboard, or just turn it off if you're not using it. So those are some of the basic features that make it clear that this was really designed with gaming in mind. Now in terms of uh, the hardware, there's going to be a more powerful version that comes out later this year that's probably better for AAA games, whereas this version that I'm looking at here is probably better for more casual games, and we'll get into that in a moment. But first I want to show you the other thing which makes this unusual, which is that it's got a SIM card slot here. Uh, so unlike most little laptops it, uh, that rely on Wi-Fi only or maybe Ethernet, this one actually supports 4G LTE for the prototype that I've been sent. Uh, there's also going to be 5G options available. So you can get it in Wi-Fi only, 4G or 5G. And it does, uh, one netbook will ship with different modems depending on your region. So the version that I've got here is uh, specific for North American uh, users. And so right now I'm connected to Wi-Fi, but if I go in to the settings and turn off Wi-Fi, you'll notice that it automatically should, yep, here we go, switch over. So now it says it's connected to T-Mobile. I don't know how well that's coming across on camera, but it does say that. So uh, I actually have a Google Fi SIM in here, and uh, it was pretty easy to set up. I just uh, sort of popped out the ejector tray, put the SIM card in, and rebooted and Windows recognized it pretty much right away. So it's a data only SIM and it should allow me to stay connected even if I were to leave the house, which I'm not doing that much of because I'm shooting this video in June of 2020 and there's a global pandemic. Um, but overall, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting little layout. Um, We've got two USB Type-C ports here on the back, uh, one of which is pretty much for uh, data only as far as I can tell. Uh, the other supports power, data, and video output. So if you connect a hub that supports USB pass-through power, you can connect an external display, charge the device all at the same time. We've also got a USB 3.0 Type-A port and a headset jack. And the only port along the sides besides that SIM card, uh, which also actually has a micro SD card reader on, uh, in the tray, uh, there's a micro HDMI port here on the back as well. So the idea I think was to try not to put too many ports on the sides so that if you do have the controllers there, they're not obscured. And most likely you're not gonna be using that if you're using the controller attached to the side. Um, one thing that's always a little bit tricky with devices this small is the usability of the keyboard. Uh, let me dim this display here a little bit. Um, it is a little bit on the small side and so it makes typing a little bit tricky. But some of the compromises that we've seen in other keyboards have been sort of done differently here. So uh, whereas a lot of little laptops wind up putting the tab key to above the Q and pushing the Q to the side, we've got a tab in the appropriate location. It's not quite as large as the tab key usually is, but it's in the right location and that makes finding it a little bit easier with my fingers. Uh, there's not really enough room over here for these buttons, the apostrophe and quotation, to be off to the side the way that I would normally expect them to be. Uh, so they're now down by the space bar which honestly I'm starting to get used to because a lot of mini laptop makers put them there. The F11 and F12 are above the nine, uh, 9 and 0. 
the weirdest thing on this particular model is this uh, question mark is all the way up here, and it took me a while to find it the first time I was looking for it. So, so this is what it looks like when you are typing. Um, I can't say it. Whoop. Cannot say it is my favorite keyboard to use, but it's not impossible. So, you know, uh, it takes a little bit of getting used to, but I do think it's something that you can get used to uh, the more time you spend with it. The keyboard's a little bit on the squishy side, I think. The keys are not only small and close together, but also if you push down, you can see a little bit of give in the center of the keyboard, which is a little bit problematic, perhaps, particularly for a device that's supposed to be designed for gaming. But um, the W, A, S, and D keys here, of course, are highlighted. Um, and should be relatively easy to make out with your fingers. And then, of course, there's little bumps that you expect in the F and the J key to help situate your fingers. So uh, overall, it's not the most pleasant typing experience that I've ever had, but it's not the worst either, necessarily. And the other thing is, of course, there's not room for a full-size touchpad, so instead we have this optical touch sensor here below the screen, which is serviceable, but I find this actually a little bit easier to just sort of reach up and touch the screen so that if I wanted to, I could move things around scroll and so forth. Now it's a uh, 1920 by 1200 pixel display which is uh, pretty high resolution for something so small and if you out of the box it has DPI scaling set to 200% so that everything's comfortable. If you really wanted to you could switch it to 100% and fit a lot more stuff on the screen but I find it a little bit hard to actually see what's going on uh, the text is really, really small when you do that. So I would prefer to keep it around 175 or 200 uh, most of the time. And I suspect unless you have really good eyesight, you're probably going to wind up uh, doing something similar to that. Uh, so it's a, it's a nice looking screen overall in terms of that. Um, I don't love that optical touch sensor. So I also connected a mouse and I can navigate that way. And that comes in handy, you know, when you're just sort of getting things done, doing a little bit of web surfing. Realizing that uh, the slash key is all the way up here and looking for some videos to watch. So, you know, it makes an okay uh, video player, uh, media streamer, etc. It is uh, something that you could theoretically use for gaming, but I should tell you that the hardware in this particular model is an Intel uh, Amber Lake 10th generation Core i5 102-10Y quad-core processor. Basically, it's a 7-watt chip with 4 cores, 8 threads, and Intel UHD graphics. And for certain types of games, like uh, casual games, uh, I'm going to load up a little Night in the Woods here. Uh, that's fine, um, and you'll notice that it gets decent frame rates and you don't have any real problems playing it. For some 3D games, it'll work reasonably well as, uh, as well, um, but for some more graphically intensive games, it's a little bit weird to think of this as a gaming laptop because it's really not got the hardware for it. Later this year, uh, One Netbook does plan to put out a version of this laptop with basically the same design, but much more powerful hardware inside. It's going to have an Intel Tiger Lake processor with Intel XE graphics, and that version is going to be a little bit more competitive with something like, say, the GPD Win Max. But uh, this version is really designed for more casual gaming. I should also point out that if you'll notice, the power button is sort of glowing this light blue, and that's because I've been running it this whole time so far in mute mode. I'm switching to normal mode, and it allows the fan to kick in a little bit higher and the CPU to get a little warmer. So you, I don't know if you heard that difference there, but that's normal mode. And I can also go into high performance mode by doing function and this button up here. And that what turns it yellow and the fan goes into the highest possible gear for the highest possible performance. So depending on the games you're playing or different activities, um, it may make a difference. So anyways, here's a little night in the woods.
So you can see we're getting roughly 60 frames per second here. Dip down to 48 for a second there, but overall, for this style of game, for more indie games that aren't super graphically intensive, I think, you know, the hardware is more than sufficient. Things get a little bit trickier if you wanted to play something that is a little bit tougher. So um, in this video, I've only got a couple of minutes left before my camera shuts off, so I'm not going to show you, but Assassin's Creed Syndicate, uh, which was able to get around 20 frames per second on the GPD Win Max, on this device only gets um, about 5 to 7 frames per second. Uh, some 3D titles do work, though, so I'm going to load Amnesia The Dark Descent and launch this game. And you'll see that we're getting reasonable frame rates. So in terms of using this for gaming, and I know we're just at the splash screen, I'm just going to talk over it for a moment. Um, you can use it for gaming, um, and it's designed with gaming in mind in terms of the actual design, obviously. Let me turn this down a little bit. But it's not necessarily got the graphics horsepower for serious 3D games that are more AAA current you know, state-of-the-art titles. Now, I've only had this for a couple of days at this point. Here we go. 50 frames per second. When I fired up the same game on the Chewy Lark box with a 10-watt Celeron J processor, it only ran at uh, around 20 frames per second. But here we're getting around 50 to 60. Although, it's kind of hard to see what's happening, I realize, because the reflection, and this is a very dark game, but you can see the FPS counter anyway. Um, anyways, so as I mentioned, I've only had this for a couple of days. I haven't had a chance to test uh, extended performance, battery life, uh, Linux, things like that yet. Um, but overall, you know, I think it's an interesting little computer that's pretty versatile. It's got that 4G LTE capability if you want to pay a little bit extra for 4G or for 5G capabilities. It's got an okay design, but I should point out that it's not uh, quite pocketable. So if you compare it in size to something like um, other 7-inch models, this is a PicoGo, which is uh, a demo unit that was sent to me a while back. It's similar in size to the One Mix 1S Yoga or the GPD Pocket 2. Um, this is a little smaller, a little closer to being pocket-sized. You can see that uh, this extra hump here at the back makes the 1GX a little harder to do that with. It's actually, if anything, more similar to the size of, I don't know, like an Amazon Fire tablet. So here's a Fire HD8 tablet that almost fits in the frame. Um, the Fire HD8 obviously has an 8-inch screen as opposed to a 7-inch screen. I just didn't happen to have a Fire 7 tablet handy. Um, and in terms of portability, the device comes with a USB charger. It's a 45 watt USB charger. It also works with USB power banks. So as I said, it's pretty versatile. It's got a 46 watt hour battery that should be good for at least a couple of hours of usage. Uh, I haven't tested it extensively, but depending on what you're doing, it's a pretty capable device. And with these USB ports, uh, I've actually been able to connect it to an external display and do a fair amount of work. I spent most of a work day writing an extensive review, which you saw a preview of if you saw the website on here before, uh, using nothing but this and an external display, keyboard and mouse. So it's got enough horsepower to be a general purpose computer. As for whether it's a gaming system or not, I think you might want to hold out for the Tiger Lake version coming later this year. This is Brad Linder with Lilliputing and the 1GX1 preview.